Now we'll talk a bit about past work and also allude to new work. I'll start with a bit of the former. Uh, they all revolve around the same topic though, so being this uh, vulnerability of the nuclear envelope. The work I will talk about today uh, is work by some of the team members that you see here, uh, mainly by three uh, students, Itzioka, uh, Freya and, and Gail, that, that I'll be talking uh, about. Our group, uh, as mentioned, is from the University of Antwerp, Laboratory of Cell Biology and Histology, and we also run a core facility, a microscopy core facility. Um, and it's from that perspective, it's also our favorite topic, imaging uh, of the cell, uh, that we mainly do our work. Our um, biological interests or our physiological interests revolve around everything that has to do with the aging process, and especially um, those that accelerate the aging process or accompany aging in the worst scenario being like neurodegenerative disorders um, and we especially uh, last year uh, start looking more into the things that they connect or that they have in common um, the main cell biological topic uh, that we are studying in this context is um, the key feature that defines the eukaryotic cell and that's obviously the nu uh, nuclear envelope it's the structure that surrounds the dna uh, and that allows uh, its selective consultation, basically. Uh, if you look at the nuclear envelope, it's a quite complex structure. It's composed of double membrane. It's got nuclear pore complexes. But the main and uh, most important aspect thereof is this uh, network, this meshwork that lies at the intranuclear surface, uh, which is called the nuclear lamina, and which uh, organizes and supports the nucleus uh, entirely. In fact, if you look at it, um, this, this is a, a 3D rendering of uh, lamin uh, expressing cells. You see that the, uh, the lamins, they envelop the entire nucleus, but also form these internal channels, these internal bundles that may provide, let's say, shortcuts or, or fast routes um, for nuclear exchange. In any case, um, what we know is that when there are uh, mutations in, in genes that encode the most important lamins, you end up with a plethora of potential diseases that range from tissue-specific disorders to uh, systemic disorders like progeria. And um, we can mainly um, 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 we can mainly connect them to either one of two situations. If we look at, um, let's say, the major gene that becomes affected, the LMNA gene, uh, there's a complete processing pathway, a maturation pathway that involves uh, resection of specific amino acids, the addition of specific post-translational modifications. And so those mutations that lead to these laminopathies, uh, uh, as they are called, either lead to a complete loss of lamins or they result in the accumulation of pre-lamin A, so mainly fun-isolated pre-lamin A, uh, which cause um, well, cellular defects. And so when we started our research, we, um, we, we first got our hands on a panel of different cells from, from, from different laminopathy patients through collaboration with uh, Jos Bruce from Maastricht University. And we started looking at what they had in common. And obviously it's a bit of an open door um, to say that most of these nuclei, uh, cell nuclei had completely uh, strange shapes, dysmorphic shapes, some bit stranger than others. And this is a bit inflated, literally here uh, in this expansion microscopy image, where you see that the cells not only have these kind of folds, uh, nuclei uh, don't have only these folds, but also blebs, uh, small extrusions, which can vary in, in, in gravity, basically, uh, or in severity. A student of mine um, who's now postdoc in the lab also wrote a very elegant script to quantify this nuclear deformation or nuclear dysmorphy and really create uh, the level of, of, of dysmorphy uh, with, with very dysmorphic nuclei um, giving a high score and, and, and less dysmorphic, a, a regular score. Uh, she also uh, included parameters to, for instance, look at uh, textural differences, which also appear to uh, emerge in certain of these laminopathy patient cells. So this was quite of a, a clear uh, relationship. But what, when, when I was studying this uh, topic of nuclear dysmorphy, uh, I suddenly came across a very, uh, let's say, unusual event, uh, being that these, 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 these small blebs um, actually were kind of weak spots that uh, led to rupture events that actually led to a sort of a loss of compartmentalization, a, a sort of a scenario that you're seeing here repeatedly. Yet, 
uh, these repetitive ruptures are not lethal because cells can still divide happily after they experience repetitive ruptures. This is a compound per geroid patient, but we saw this in different kinds of laminopathy patients. And so a bit struck by this event, we started looking into what this has in terms of consequences, functional consequences for the cell. Well, first of all, because you lose compartmentalization, there's a lot of material that's completely lost in terms of uh, localization. You have proteins that move into the nucleus and those that move out. And there are also, uh, let's say, important regulatory factors, like in this case, the F kappa beta factor, LA, can move into the nucleus uh, during a rupture. I'm not entirely sure whether this directly influences the gene expression behavior. We did connect it to changes in gene expression, uh, but we haven't shown that P65 is actually active at that moment. So uh, this remains to be, uh, to be shown. But what we also found is that actually much bigger structures like PML bodies actually move out uh, during these ruptures. So at several points in time here, you'll see rupture events where individual PML bodies start roaming the cytoplasm, uh, moving out of the nucleus. They start fragmenting, uh, but, but you lose them entirely. So you can imagine that this has a tremendous impact on the homeostasis of the cell. Um, in fact, once in a while, we even saw mitochondria in the nucleus. This is not a mainstream thing, but we, we did see it once in a while. We, uh, so even large structures can actually even move in and out. So the bottom line is that these nuclear rupture events, which are now well known, seem to really um, completely destroy cell homeostasis, even though it's only briefly. In fact, the cells also respond. We also found that they, they, they kind of very gently respond to the actual rupture in a kind of a mechanical way. When you look at this image here where we combine uh, a histone protein with the nuclear localization sequence coupled M-cherry, uh, you see that during the rupture, the nucleus contracts. Maybe you should focus here on the top. And it, it kind of in, becomes more intense, the uh, histone 2B signal, which kind of suggests that there's a sort of a compaction, uh, which we attribute to a sort of a defensive reflex, uh, perhaps a protective measure to avoid uh, DNA from getting too much damage or uh, um, I know, this, this could be a possible uh, explanation for this. All of these events were quite anecdotal. And so in order to try and uh, get a better grip on the process uh, and try and see what exactly governs these uh, nuclear rupture events, we decided to um, set up a more systematic approach. So the first thing we did was write a, 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 let's say a pipeline to start tracking individual cells and quantifying these nuclear rupture events automatically to be able to, first of all, score their frequency, but also the, uh, their kinetics, basically, the repair time, et cetera. So to do that, we co-expressed just what I showed you before, um, the M-cherry NLS with the histone 2B, because the histones are so firmly bound that they don't leak out of the nucleus during a rupture. So we could use a sort of a ratiometric approach to, to score nuclear ruptures. And then looking at the exact moment of rupture, we could then start um, analyzing the recovery. Um, we did, well, we did this for several cell types. Uh, here you see it for a, a mass embryonic fibroblasts. Uh, and then we could, well, actually also align using in silico synchronization all these individual ruptures to try and score their repair times and get a sort of an average, um, getting more quantitative metrics out of that. And this is what we currently now use to analyze rupture events, score them uh, in a quantitative way. So the first thing that we did was ask relatively trivial questions like, is um, a lamin uh, an important feature um, in, in the generation of these ruptures? And to do that, we established a knockout cell lines using CRISPR technology. Uh, at that time, we generated individual single cell colonies. And um, I'm not sure whether that was best, the best strategy. Um, now we tend to use pools. Yeah? So these are really individual selected uh, colonies. And our impression is that this leads to a high variability because the individual clones might drift and, and might deviate very much. Uh, but anyway, we validated that they're complete knockouts. So they're, strangely enough, most of the time full knockouts. We never, almost never have heterogeneous or haploinsufficient uh, phenotypes. And we also validated that they experience more ruptures, uh, excessively more ruptures. I, I should mention that we did this in fibrosarcoma cells. Um, 
which actually already experience quite quite a lot of rupture events. It's something we don't find in fibroblasts, for instance. We then also wondered whether the accumulation of the pre lamin A, so the other possibility, the toxic gain of function, uh, would lead to more ruptures. And to that end, we actually uh, knocked out the gene that is responsible for the last maturation step, the, the step that actually cleaves off the finessylated moiety from the pre A. So if you, if you knock it out, if you deplete it, you get a complete accumulation of pre A. So we also validated this. We knocked out the gene. Uh, we got variable impact on the gene expression level, uh, but we got a very consistent impact on the accumulation of pre A, as you can also see here on the immunofluorescent image. And also, again, as you can see here on the Western blot, all of the clones that we generated are full uh, homozygous knockouts because they all have a shift in band in the pre lamin A or in the lamin A um, molecular weight range. Um, there is no lamin A band left, so we assume that it's a full knockout. Only here, we didn't get a very clear uh, picture. Actually, there was a sort of a a trend, but not really consistent increase, so not a significant increase in the in the amount of ruptures. But I'll come back to that a bit later on. What we did see is that when we started manipulating uh, either lamin knockout cells or control cells, that they would become more sensitive to um, to specific compounds. Uh, for instance, to compounds that perturb cytoskeletal function. For instance, platinum, which um, um, uh, affects uh, actomyosin contractility, uh, abolished basically nuclear rupture propensity. And remodeling, uh, which supposedly um, is not really clear, but is assumed to uh, uncouple microtubules, also reduced it to a certain extent, especially in lamin knockout cells. Um, so this actually indicated that um, especially cytoskeletal force has a major impact on um, on nuclear rupture propensity. This wasn't a surprise. Colleagues uh, from the Lammerling lab, lab and, and Mathieu Pierre's lab had also already shown that when, when cells migrate through narrow constrictions that they also experience nuclear ruptures and that this is also driven by cytoskeletal force. So triggered by that, we, we also tried different ways of evoking nuclear ruptures and our approach was to actually squeeze nuclei. It's also a tried technology uh, by the Pierre lab um, but we initially tried uh, atomic force microscopy. So we used a, a cantilever to really squeeze nuclei, individual nuclei, uh, and we could really consistently evoke ruptures at a certain point in time. Um, the only thing is that if you do it with AFM, your throughput is very low, eh? so you, 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 you can't really use it for a population level statistic approach. So then we went to the PL lab and we, uh, they were kind enough to, uh, to lend there a certain device that actually compresses a whole population um, using sort of a microfluidic stamp. Um, and uh, this really allows to, 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 to really um, parallelize the compression and also induce ruptures on us, basically. Um, we also, um, well, we're still using this uh, compression device to study exactly, because that's what, it, what, what we find interesting, what exactly happens eh, at, the, at the moment of rupture. Um, so we still use this compression device to study the kinetics of different molecules that tend to mobilize to the ruptures, like buff or like sea gas. And so we can easily see uh, all, the, all the things here in purple are, are uh, buff um, molecules accumulating at the, what we presume to be sites of rupture. Um, but what you should note here is that we can't really control when and where the ruptures will happen. We have, let's say, a bit of control over when it will happen. So usually upon confinement, a couple of cells will already rupture. Um, but there's a lot of cells that will rupture and we can't say where exactly the rupture will happen. And so what we wanted to do was gain even more control and try to really pinpoint the place where a rupture would occur. To do so, we took on a completely different turn and we uh, made use of a, a technology that was already tried uh, for actually a completely different purpose, namely for cell delivery. Um, the technology is much less invasive than, for instance, laser ablation. It doesn't really uh, damage uh, um, your biological materials that much, um, but it needs or it requires sensitizing particles like gold. 
The principle behind this uh, approach is that you illuminate the gold with uh, uh, laser pulses that will cause these plasmonic particles to kind of um, um, uh, um, resonate uh, and, and thereby um, their, their energy dissipation will eventually lead to a sort of a, a, a bubble around, around the gold nanoparticle. And so this bubble has sufficient force kind of very locally damage uh, your nearby structure like a membrane. So it's not as exaggerated as what I'm showing you here. Um, and this is kind of what we do basically, uh, but it's very effective. Yeah? So it's, it's, uh, it's been used to selectively and spatially selectively label individual cells. In this case, it's just using dextrins to label individual cells in a pattern of choice. Uh, but we want to actually use it to temporarily um, um, damage the nuclear envelope and see whether that would lead to a nuclear envelope rupture event. So we showed that we can bring gold close enough to the nuclear envelope and that we can generate these, well, nanobubbles in the proximity of the nuclear envelope. And we also showed that it is possible to generate these nuclear envelope rupture events by doing so. So, so we've, we kind of proved the concept. Um, we also analyzed the kinetics that we thereby inflicted, so the recovery curves, and they were quite similar to those that we found in lamin knockout cells. Uh, and in most of the cases, the cells didn't die. But the, the real issue um, with this technique is that it's super suboptimal, um, in the sense that about 5 to 10% of the times we have a successful uh, photoporation event or nuclear photoporation event. And that's obviously, I think the picture on the left already shows you why we can't control as yet where the gold will end up. And so it's just being taken up by the cells or we electroporate it, uh, and it's about everywhere. So not all cells have gold close to the nucleus, and a lot of cells have gold elsewhere, like in the lysosomes. And therefore, if you then start illuminating, you're going to damage the cells. So what we're doing now is trying to control the localization of the gold better such that we can really trigger um, these nuclear envelope ruptures much more uh, uh, targetedly. Uh, having said that, we could really see a lot of typical features. So when we induce these uh, uh, photoporation induced ruptures, uh, we could see the mobilization of sea gas, which recognizes the cytoplasmic uh, DNA. We could see the mobilization of CHIM4B, which is supposedly um, responsible for the repair of the nuclear envelope uh, and we could even see a lamin scar which is then the sort of a um, um, the damage left after uh, the rupture event um, i just wanted to very briefly deviate because um, when we when we were working with this photoporation technique we also looked a bit at what happens when we do this kind of cell-based um, photoporation so what i showed you here when we try to just use photoporation at the level of the cell so to try and just grasp how cells respond to it. And funnily enough, we used um, just simple shotgun sequencing for this. Uh, of all the genes that become dysregulated, when you use simple plasma membrane level photoporation, one of the most, um, let's say, significant ones that becomes deregulated is the LMNA gene. So this was quite of a surprise because we're not even touching uh, the nucleus at that point in time. Plus, lamins are notoriously stable proteins. Yet, um, when we looked at um, the protein level, we also found that relatively short after uh, the uh, photoporation procedure, lamins had already increased, uh, the signal and, and the intensity of the lamins had already increased. Um, in fact, when we looked a bit further, we saw that this kind of um, go, um, 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 went hand in hand uh, with the fact that also the chromatin became more condensed so that we will use DAPI, we also used histone markers, but uh, we saw that during a relatively short period of time, let's say about 12 hours after photoporation, cells seem to kind of contract, show a higher lamin A signal and also stronger chromatin condensation. And this was a bit reminiscent uh, to the uh, image or the movie that I showed you before, where the, the nucleus contracted and condensed its chromatin. What, what, what we believe is happening here is that the cell kind of responds already to a mechanical insult at the level of the plasma membrane um, by strengthening or by rigidification of its nucleus. Um, but yeah, this is a completely different topic. So uh, I still wanted to talk about something else. Um, and that is, um, 
we've been studying these lamin uh, related um, rupture events, but we were wondering, um, does this have a broader impact for other diseases as well? Mainly, for instance, for viral infections. There's a lot of viruses that actually require access to the nucleus uh, before they actually can move on to replicate and, uh, and further infect. Um, and so we went to study uh, one of the uh, typical DNA viruses being HPV or um, the um, human papilloma virus. Um, and, and asked would uh, lamins basically um, influence their infection kinetics. Um, to address this, we, um, we, we use a sort of a pseudovirus, which actually has the exact same structure as the papilloma virus, but instead of the uh, viral DNA, it just contains a, a sort of a pseudogenome uh, that carries a reporter, an EGFP reporter. So when you then image it, these are just... Um, if I'm not wrong, these are just HeLa cells. We also did it for HaCat cells, uh, which are then infected with the pseudogenome. You see that actually it takes quite a while for these cells to start um, showing a signal, about 24 hours, slightly faster. But then you'll see certain cells becoming greenish, which are actually then successfully infected cells. So what we did was then, well, I kind of open up the spectrum and uh, generated uh, different knockout cell lines. So we crispr cell lines, this time pooled cell lines, uh, for all uh, major lamins, lamin A um, or lamin A, lamin B1, lamin B2. We also made triple knockouts. Um, and you can clearly see uh, the very varied impact of these um, knockouts on, on nuclear morphology. So you have the typical well-known uh, complete nuclear dysmorphy uh, for lamin A um, C knockouts. Uh, but what is cool is that a lamin B1 knockout leads to the typical blips. And so these very small extrusions, which are just, just that more overt with lamin B1. Whereas lamin B2 knockouts don't seem to have any major defect at all. So very, very um, cool. Anyway, um, we then looked at do they indeed experience uh, more infection? And funnily enough, um, we use both siRNA, by the way, and CRISPR-Cas. Um, we only found a very strong impact on the infection ratio uh, for cells that were knocked out or knocked down uh, for lamin B1. And it was really striking. So here's a movie uh, for the lamin B1 knockouts. Uh, it still takes some time. And that's mainly because most of these cells require actually mitosis before they actually... Um, allow the entry of the virus. But then you'll see that the signal starts um, rising much faster, much stronger, and that the, uh, the eventual signal is also much, much stronger and that you also see in the montages here below. Uh, so we wondered what, what actually would lie uh, under the basis of, of this uh, right here. Well, first of all, lamin B1 knockouts are notoriously rupture prone. And so I call them stroboscopic ruptures because they can kind of continuously rupture. They're like the compound progeroid cells that I showed in the beginning. They have these continuous blebs. They rupture continuously, much more, at least at first sight. Uh, we're still doing the quantifications than the, um, the lamin A, um, AC knockouts, for instance. So that could be one explanation. And indeed, um, when you look at cells, this was a, not a trivial exercise, but uh, Freya made it work. So when you then look at cells that rupture but do not undergo mitosis, and you look at um, pseudovirus inside the nucleus, we find that there are more. And so we, we used an EDU labeling. We find that there are more uh, pseudoviruses in the nucleus of those uh, nuclei versus those that do not rupture. So this could already um, explain some of the higher load in these cells. Second of all, uh, when looking at the mitotic window of this cell, so the time that the cells spend in mitose, lamin B1 knockouts also take much longer. It's about 30, 40% longer uh, that they, um, they spend in mitose. So that's also a longer window for the virus to enter the nucleus. So these two, um, so, so let's say the nuclear ruptures and, and this prolonged mitotic window suggest that there's a higher uh, uh, viral load in these cells that would explain the higher signal, the higher infection ratio. So I'll just end with my take-home message. Um, I hope that 
uh, in Toulouse, we'll be able to show you a bit more of our uh, work on an estrus. This was now just an excerpt, but I hope to have convinced you that it might be a very important pathogenic driver with uh, broad spectrum relevance. Thank you for your attention. Uh, maybe I, I will start uh, with, with some questions. So, in your in the first part of your work, where you were studying uh, so the the these blebs and this this uh, nuclear uh, membrane rupture, um, are, are you able to measure the mechanical properties of 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 the of the membrane and or, or on the nucleus and try to see uh, how 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 these this, uh, properties are perturbed in this in this uh, lamin A uh, mutant? Uh, are you referring to um, the, the forces? Kind of, yeah, forces and like, uh, I mean, um, shearing, shearing properties or I mean, all this uh, mechanical, really the mechanics of, 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 the, of the nucleus. Yeah, the, only, uh, the, the only way you could approach that is either to make use of, so with AFM, we can measure the actual force that, that you have to apply to provoke a rupture. Mm -hmm. But we tried this a couple of times and it was very variable. Um, so it was very difficult to get a fixed value out of that. Um, and at the level of the, um, uh, of, the, uh, of the nuclear envelope, we tried using a, a link reporter to give in with the Conway lab, uh, so, so a, a sort of a, a threat sensor. Um, but also here it was very difficult to get absolute values as yet. So we're still working on that. But uh, um, these, are, these are the logical things, I guess, uh, you could propose. And, and and regarding also this this uh, effect where you do see the rigidification of uh, of the nucleus or the fact that you it seems that you have more compact uh, chromatin, did you check by chip seek or I don't know MNA sec that the chromatin structure is perturbed during yeah. this uh, this event or? It's a very it's... good proposal, but we haven't checked that. Yet. Yeah. So the only what, thing what could be the mechanisms behind? I mean, yeah, we don't very well know to be honest. <laughs> Thank you for the very interesting talk. I enjoyed it as a morphologist. Do you listen to me? Do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, when you knock down lamin B, you, in fact, imitate senescence. But you never never use this term. Can the, you tell we me do, Yeah, we, we, because we don't induce it in HALA cells. It's a bit strange, but we don't. We, when we do it in, for instance, when we knock it down in fibroblasts, we get senescence. Um, but when we do it in HALA cells, we, we don't get senescence. They still grow. What do you mean by do not get senescence? You have a hypermethylation, it is a rather, rather characteristic for senescence. How, do, how have you uh, tested that you do not have or you have senescence? Ah, because the cells still divide is our main readout yeah, for this. Yeah, so that, that's... <laughs> must fall slow in mitosis, yeah? Do they it is, enter, yeah, yeah. yeah, they have gas stink activation. Do they enter mitotic slippage? Have you noticed? Do, uh, do they enter mitotic what? Mitotic slippage from uh, tetraploids, um, polyploid cells and so on. Um, not that I know of, no, no, not really, no. Yeah, but no, I think that these are related things. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for the suggestion. So we have also a question. Uh from the chat, it's uh, so a great talk. Do you think chromatin is more compacted closer to the nuclear envelope or yeah. is chromatin more compacted everywhere? Yeah, it's, uh, well, uh, so it's very clear from I, uh, the image that it's especially in the blebs, for instance, it's massive, um, but it's also all over um, more compact. So that I, I, I do have to admit, it's a bit of a long shot. I, I, and I don't know if it's actually any way um, related to state that an all over more condensed climate of the host nucleus would affect that of an episome. I have no clue at all. It's just a suggestion. Um, if anybody knows of such an event, I would be very happy to hear about it. Um, but, but at least our impression is that it's an all over event for these cells. Yeah. 